How are we doing? Good. We good? Merry Christmas to you all. Okay. It's like coming right up, huh? Hey, um, so Robin mentioned it. We're in this season, uh, not winter. It feels like it should be winter, right? But it's still technically fall. Isn't that weird? But it's, wi- are you all like alive? Are you going to respond this morning? <laughs> this will work better if we like do this together today, okay? Um, yeah, so, but we're in this season called Advent right now. And uh, maybe you know about Advent, maybe you've been around church for a long time, maybe you just thought Advent was like that excuse to eat candy for 25 days in Christmas or something, or you thought it was maybe an idea that Lego came up with, right, when they made their Advent calendar, but Advent really was, is created by the church, it's put on the church calendar so that we would take a season and we would anticipate the arrival of a noteworthy person. That's all that Advent really means, is that the anticipation, you're looking forward to the arrival of someone noteworthy. And so obviously what we're doing in Advent is we are celebrating and we are getting ready to celebrate our, our Savior incarnated, stepping out of heaven, putting on human flesh so that he may enter into the brokenness and the sadness and the darkness of this world so that he may come and redeem and reconcile and restore us all. Amen? And like, that's why we're here this month, and, and I mean, it's really why we're here every, every Sunday morning, right, is because of that truth, what happened on Christmas thousands of years ago. Um, but I just, I love, I love this time where we get to reflect on that truth, because it's been uh, Kent's pattern that I've watched over the last several years, is that every year in Advent, he sort of has this theme, right? There's sort of this idea or this theme that runs all the way through December that, that sort of culminates or, or unravels towards Christmas Eve, right? And, and it's just this beautiful thing, and we're going to be doing that this year. We're going to be looking at the truth of who God is as he relates himself to the experience of a table, of a table. Because there's so many different stories of tables in scriptures, and they all uh, represent and, and sort of uh, reveal to us these different truths about who he is. And I'll stop right off the bat. Like, I just, I love that God does this. Our God is so unfathomably big. He's so huge. Job says that uh, there's none that can fathom the mysteries of God. There's no one who can even probe probe the limits of the Almighty. You think about that. He's he's huge. He's vast. His greatness is ever-increasing. You can spend your whole life trying to understand the the nuance and the details of who God is and how kind and how good and how loving, how, how wonderful He is. And, and it would only begin to scratch the surface of the start of it. Isn't that awesome? And yet, even while God, almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, this just supreme being, even though he is those things, he chooses to reveal who he is through these intimate human experiences. And that's just so profound to me because you realize that he is God. He does get to decide how the creation lives and how they perceive and how they take in new information, how they learn about different things. And so he gets to choose how he is revealed to us. And so I love that rather than just being in some like glass case somewhere where we can all go, okay, yeah, look, there's God, there's who he is. He chooses to say, I'm like this. And he puts it to us in a way that we can experience him like we would experience anything, like we'd experience supper like as a family together. Right, I messaged one of my friends this week and I was just like, hey, um, I'm preparing this message on, on the table and I just wanted to let you know that like, I just, I love when our families get together and we just are together, right? Isn't there just, when, when everything's right at a table, uh, doesn't it just like produce something in us? Like if we sit down at a table, so have you ever just sat at a table and everything was right? Like everything was good, like ev- all the right people were there uh, I, I love like going to weddings personally and you got all your like friends, you got all your family and you're just sitting at a table and you're eating good food, you're celebrating, you're rejoicing and, and everything for a moment when you're sitting at the right table, it, like for the moment, the rest of the world fades away, does it not? Like the rest of the world just sort of melts and all of its problems and all the chaos. I'm not saying it goes away for forever, but for a moment at a table when you're with the people you wanna be with, you're eating the food you wanna eat and it's so good and it's just like, creates this almost sacred moment, right? Where the rest of the world kind of just disappears. But we could be really honest, right? Because we just are fresh off of Thanksgiving and like my guess is none of us would describe our family tables as perfect, right? 
How, how many of you, just so you can, like, raise your hand if this is you, and we can all just kind of covet you for a second. How many of you would describe this, even this last Thanksgiving, as just like, it was perfect. The food was perfect. There was no family tension, no family drama. Everything went so perfectly well. No hands. No hands, for real? Okay, you, I mean, don't be afraid to say it. Like, yeah, we just all want to be like that at Thanksgiving, right? There's three of you in this room. But how many of us can also admit, like, I've been at family tables where everything went way south, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, all the hands are, like, shooting right up. But, like, like Aunt, Uncle Bill, like, brought up that thing that Aunt Sue warned him not to bring up at the table with all the family. And so now she's mad at him. And now, you, like, everyone's frustrated because this per- what was supposed to be this perfect, quiet family meal is full of all this tension. And, and, and this guy brought up what Donald Trump is doing. And so now it's like, oh, all this conversation, what's happening, right? And, and your mom kind of loses her mind because what was supposed to be this perfect family meal where we all stop and we gather and we get together and we share this sweet, tender moment is ruined. Because there's something in us that craves this experience of a perfect table, right? And, and, and hopefully you've had one of these moments where you sit down at a table and the company that you're with is just like, you're just with people that you love. You're eating food that you love. You're drinking good drink. Like everything in that moment is just right. And what happens when we're in moments like that at the table with the people we love, doing the things we love, like the rest of the world just seems to melt away for a moment, right? It doesn't last forever. Like you have to eventually get up from the table and move away. But that moment at the table, if it's right, if everyone's behaving themselves, right? And no one's bringing up anything about Donald Trump. Like it's just like, it's, everything's okay. <laughs> it's perfect. And it's this moment where we just, you feel like you belong. Like, so I, I realize I'm talking to everyone north of like 16 in the room, okay? Because all you kids are like, why are we still sitting here? Like, I'd like to go. But right, adults, is it not like one of the greatest things? to Just sit back at a table. And the good news is this morning that there is the story of a perfect table and it's found in scripture. And, and it's, it's Jesus and the last supper. And so this, this story is in uh, the gospels. I'm gonna read it out of uh, the book of Luke this morning. We're gonna go to chapter 22. And we're going to read about Jesus' last moments with his disciples sitting around a table. He's got them gathered and he's having his dinner and he's explaining like some of the most profound things to them through the simple human experience of, of sitting at a table, breaking bread, and drinking from the fruit of the vine. Not, not wine, not juice. Like it, we just, it's just fruit of the vine, okay? That's why you can have the past to drink whichever one you want. Just throwing that out there. So, starting in, uh, what verse do I have to start in? Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat of it. They said to him, Where, where will you have us prepare it? Like, they didn't have a place, you know what I mean? They didn't have, like, a spot to just sit down and eat a meal. And so Jesus says to them, Behold, This is such a Jesus thing to do, okay? He says, when you enter the city, there will be a guy carrying a jar of water that will meet you. Follow him into his house that he enters and then tell the master of the house that it's like this password, right? He's like, gotta, he's like, say this like code word for him. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples, right? Like it's just kind of cryptic and it's kind of, like just random guy? Can't, like why, why does he have a jar of water? This is where my brain goes. Okay, let's keep going though. And he will show you a large upper room that's furnished and you'll prepare it there. And they went and surprise, they found it just as he had told them. And there they prepared the Passover. So we're gonna talk about the Lord's table today. We're gonna talk about communion. We're gonna talk about the, the last supper. This, what, what happens here at this table? Because it's profound and it's significant. And, I, and my worry is that we come to the communion table in a couple different ways. We either come to it flippantly, like because it's just the routine thing that we do every week, or we just come and we just don't really think about what we're doing. We don't take the time to actually remember and reflect what the, what the significance of these elements mean. Because it's not just juice. It, it is juice. It's Welch's grape juice, okay? Like we bought it probably at King Supers. Like I, I asked Deanna this week, I was like, where do we get the bread? She's like, I think we order it online. There's nothing significant about the bread and the juice. It's what they represent. It's what we come to remember why they're there. And so 
communion really it gets its it gets its beginnings it gets its origin uh, origin story in the old testament in what was first mentioned in this verse the 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 passover feast and and the feast of unleavened bread so you got the passover meal and the feast of unleavened bread and and jesus is painting this picture of what communion will be like what it means the representation of it at the passover meal it's significant it's not like he just picked some random dinner to do this it's very, very significant why he picked this meal. This meal is like, it's, it's the meal in the Jewish, Jewish culture. Like, I was trying to think of like a good meal to compare it to. Like, it's like the 4th of July barbecue, where it's like, you know we're doing it. We're all getting together. We're all like celebrating America's freedom, right? And, it's, and, and yet, like, I didn't even want to mention that because it's such a shadow of what the depth and the richness of Passover really is. How many of you all have ever done a Seder meal? Can you just raise your hand? Oh, awesome. Yeah, several of you. I, I would say if you get the chance to do a Seder meal sometime, you should absolutely participate. Michael and Trish Kalstein, you guys hosted one a few years back now. And it just brings so much light and so much clarity into all the elements of Passover. And so I want to tell you the story of Passover. We're not going to turn to it. We don't have time. It's in Exodus 12 if you want to read it. But to know the story of communion, we have to know the story of Israel. Because Israel is this nation that God loves, God deep, they're his chosen nation. And, and really the origin of the story is, is in Egypt, where Israel is enslaved to Egypt. They're being oppressed, they're, in, they're enslaved, they're doing what the Egyptians want them to do. And, and God says, hey, I'm going to let my people go. He uses this guy Moses. Uh, really, we all love Moses, but he's kind of shady, right? Like he's killed a guy with his bare hands, buried them out in the sands of the desert somewhere, right? Like Moses not perfect. Probably couldn't work here. You know, he's got kind of a crazy background. Can't communicate really clearly. You know what I mean? Like, he's got a stutter. So it's just, I don't know. Like, I'm just saying. Anyway, Moses is called to, he's like, God's like, hey, you're going to go tell Pharaoh that you're going to let my people go. And, and Moses goes and he goes and, and God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And there's a lot in that phrase that we probably have to wrestle with and deal with. But, but Pharaoh uh, doesn't let him go. Nine times, right? You have all these plagues. You have, you have boils and gnats and you have blood and you have like all this crazy stuff happening, right? All the, all the plagues, like if you, like I understand a lot of you probably learned about the plagues when you were like four. And so you're like, yeah, I know all the plagues. And you think about them in Sunday school and you're clapping. And it's like, I, I learned about them when I was like 20. And so I'm like, no, this is crazy. Like, could you imagine what this would be like in, in like a region, in just an area, if, this, if these kinds of things happened? And, and especially when you think about the 10th plague, because the 10th plague is God saying, hey, um, the firstborn in every household is going to die. That's going to be my final act of judgment. But he provides for Israel a way out. See, he, he provides for them a way for them to be passed over by this judgment, by this, by this terrible, terrible plague. And what happens is we, we can't miss it because I think we tell ourselves the story and we, we forget the detail that uh, Israel isn't just like let off scot-free. It's not like they're just, they're just like, oh, God's like, I love you, so free pass. Like you don't even have to worry about it. No, there is something that has to happen first, right? They have to take a young baby lamb and they have, it's got to be blemish free. It's got to be perfect. And they have to slaughter that lamb. They have to put the evidence of the sacrifice over their doorposts. And when God sees the evidence of that sacrifice, then he passes over. See, because the sacrifice had to be made, because although God did love Israel, they were not perfect, right? And you follow the story of Israel throughout the Old Testament, and man, that truth only gets like more and more and more clear. Because God, after that, rescues them. It's the Passover. He says, hey, you're going to have to, when, when, when uh, Pharaoh realizes what happened, right? Can you imagine the chaos and just the, the tragedy of like Loveland, Northern Colorado, all of us, if like we just woke up and the firstborn in every household was gone. And no, no wonder Pharaoh says, get out of here. Go, leave. But God tells them to go quickly because, God, because Pharaoh's, uh, sadness quickly turns to anger and then he pursues them, right? He's like, no, 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 I'm just gonna kill them all. But so God says, hey, when this happens, when you wake up, when you get going, when it's time for your salvation, you leave so quickly that you don't even put any leaven in your bread, right? How many of you guys have made bread before? Robin mentioned it. You can make a fresh baked loaf of bread. I cannot, like I could not do that for my neighbors. They would be like, I'll never come to your church ever. I will stick with cookies, okay? I can make some good chocolate chip cookies. I'll stick, I'll stay in my lane. I'm not gonna make bread. 
But how many of you have made bread and what's an important component to letting the bread rise to making the loaf actually fluffy and delicious is yeast, leaven, right? But that takes time, does it not? Like you gotta wait really patiently. Uh, there's something about like, it's gotta be in a warm place. Like I don't, I don't totally understand. Like I said, I've never really done it well. But you gotta let the leaven rise and it takes time. And God says, listen, when it's time for your salvation, you don't even have a moment to spare. Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's gonna start coming after you. You gotta, don't even let the leaven permeate the permeate the dough, just bake it and get out of there. And so they do, they, you know, there's all this other stuff that we could talk about with Israel because in reality, here's what we have to know about Israel's story that's still true about our story today, is that God gave Israel the perfect system. He gave them the means. He gave them every tool they needed to experience a life with him. He gave them the law. He gave them all the rules. He said, this is what you have to do. And, and, and in all reality, Israel, like, they had the means to do what they needed to do to experience a life with God in the promised land. But the reality for Israel and the reality for us is that we, we, just, we just can't do it, right? We just can't choose God over ourselves, over other gods of this land, over, over other things. We pursue all this other stuff and we turn a blind eye to God, even though he's clearly done such good things in our life. It's true for Israel and it's true for us today. And so take that information and we're going to jump back into the communion story, the Last Supper story. Make sure I'm not skipping anything, okay? I'll, let me just say I am skipping something. It's one of my, it's little, but it's one of my favorite things. I love that God creates all the um, times in the Jewish calendar for feasts and festivals, right? Like, if you ever wonder why we like try to have a fun time in church, like why we think this should be a celebration, why it should be like just awesome, is because like God has put that very thumbprint on our souls of celebration, of, of, of just rejoicing over what he's done. And so, yeah, we sing. Yeah, we lift our hands up during worship. Yeah, we do stuff that may look silly to the rest of the world. But like, this is awesome, is it not? And so we get in here and we celebrate and we rejoice because our God has put, like it was his idea that we do that. And so Passover is one of those feasts. Passover is probably the most significant feast. And so we'll jump back into it because this is where it really starts to hit the road in the message today. It says, and when the hour came, when it was time to eat the, when it was time to eat the Passover meal, he, Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I, I love this line, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. As in, I'm going to the cross because of things that you have done and I am eager to spend time with you. I'm eager to eat with you. I'm, I love sitting at the table with you. And he says, this is where it gets, this is the key. For I tell you that I will not eat the Passover until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He's saying that this, this meal will never be the same. There's gonna be something that happens that's tied to my suffering that, that the Passover meal will never be the same as it was before. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks to it, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so Christ is our Passover lamb. He said, hey, like I, I, you weren't gonna be perfect. You were never gonna be perfect. This whole system was created where they still had to sacrifice lambs and they had to sacrifice these like blemish free spotless lambs. And he said, and he's going in this picture, I am that Passover lamb. It's not that your sin is insignificant. It's not that I don't care about your sin because I love you. Your sin is a problem, is it like, right? Yeah. Like sin is serious. And if you wanna understand the severity of our sin, we need to look no further than the cross of Christ. You're like, Austin, this is the wrong message. This is Easter, this isn't like Christmas. You're in the wrong time. No, they're so woven together. We have to understand that the incarnation doesn't mean anything without Jesus's death and resurrection, right? And so, Jesus says, hey, listen, in a moment, I'm gonna suffer. And he knows at this table, he knows as he's sitting there with his closest friends, he's like, I'm going to suffer. He knows how the story is gonna end. He knows that he's about to be arrested and put on trial and found guilty 
uh, wrongly. He's not supposed to go there, but he knows that he's going to go there. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, weeping so hard that he's producing blood. Like, I've, I've had good cries before, but, I've, but never like that. Never like that. He's saying, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours. So what Jesus is saying is, if there's any other way to do this, I'll do it. I, I would like that option, but not my will, but your way. Because in a moment on the cross, God's wrath for sin, his perfect wrath is colliding with his perfect love for us. So that in a moment, Jesus can say, hey, I'm standing in place of where you should be because I love you. It's not that your sin's insignificant, it is, it's serious. But I've paid the price for your sin. And so here's the cool thing, is that just as the angel of death would pass over the Israelite households, so God's judgment passes over us when we have adorned ourselves with the righteousness of Christ. And how, like, so how, wait, how do you do that? Well, Jesus was our blemish-free lamb. He has poured out his blood. And now when, when, the great thing is, is when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, when you give him your life, that righteousness that he wore is now on us. And that is worth like the rest of our life in worship in and of itself, is it not? I have been forgiven. But it's not just what Jesus, um, it's not just that he forgave us on the cross. There's so much more to it. And so, um, he takes the bread, he gives thanks for it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. He, he gives the bread in this symbolic act of giving himself. He's giving himself to us. And so there's three things that happen in communion. I'm just going to go through three things. There's, there's probably more, but there's three things that I picked out that happen at the communion table. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take some time to just commune, to spend a moment with your Savior because it's not just a check the box kind of thing that we're gonna do. And so the first thing that God gives us at the communion table is our redemption. He offers us redemption at the communion table. And so this is important because I think a lot of ways that we try to frame up our, um, our relationship with God, when people are like, oh, so you're a Christian, tell me what that means. And, and I think we like to start the story with going, well, here's the moment where I realized I was sinful, Here's the moment I realized I had a savior. And then so, so I was sinful, now I'm saved. And here I, here I am and it's awesome, right? And, and I would say, absolutely, that is part of the story. That is the story of justification, right? That is the story of how you, how you went from, from dead in your trespasses to alive in Christ. That's absolutely right. But redemption is a greater narrative that the story of justification fits into. Redemption, redemption's like this. I've been reading this book called Blessed, Broken, Given by Glenn Packiam. I would absolutely recommend it to anyone here who wants to get it. But in it, he describes this ancient uh, Japanese art form called kintsugi, kintsugi. And what's cool about kintsugi is uh, it's where the Japanese people, there's this whole cool origin story that I don't have time to go into, but basically like broken pottery, pottery or like a, a cup or like something like that that's significant is broken. And it's, it's put back together. Uh, it's mended with a golden resin. And so they take gold and they put it in all these cracks and they put it back together to restore it to what it was meant to be. That's the picture of redemption. Because no longer is this cup just a regular, ordinary cup. It has a beauty that's on it now that is unlike before. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like it's more beautiful than it was before, Right? And so there's actually stories of, of people who would like intentionally break pottery just so that they could put it back together so they could mend it with this golden resin in between it so that it would be more beautiful than it was before. That's what redemption is. Yes, you've been justified. Yet, okay, look, I know that there's a sin problem in the world. I know I have a sin problem. You know you have a sin problem. The rest of the world knows that they have a sin problem by and large, right? We don't need to go and tell the story of, hey, you sinful person, you're in need of a savior. And that's all that we tell them because that's not the whole story. God says, hey, I have a purpose that I want to weave into your life. I want to redeem past hurting parts of your story. I want to take what's broken. I want to breathe fresh life into you. I want to redeem all parts of who you used to be. It's not just that you have a sin problem. It's that I have a plan for you. Do you see that? Redemption. It's so much, it's part of justification, but it's so much more. It's God saying, you're my chosen son. You're my chosen daughter. I'm pleased with you. I have things that I want you to do. You, you were made to, to be the reflection of God's glory into his creation. 
you weren't just made to punch a clock, to go to do this, to go do that. Just live, save up some money, maybe not have some money, retire and die. You were made to be a, 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 a fingerprint, a reflection into this world of all that God has created us to be. That's the story of redemption. That's what's offered to us at the communion table. And you can see it in the verse where Jesus says, this cup that has been poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, listen, the old system of sacrifices, it's finding its fulfillment in who I am. I am fulfilling all that that stuff meant to be. All that stuff, God gave us that system. He gave Israel all those laws so that we might see that even with the perfect system, we're never gonna make it on our own. While all the other religions are trying to get to God, God is trying to get to us, right? Uh, and that's, that's what the story of the incarnation is. That's the story of Christmas. That's the story of communion. God saying, I'm pouring out my blood as a new covenant so that by grace, through faith, you may be saved. And so now, if, as long as we're just clinging to and we're, we're pursuing this faith, God is pleased with you, Man, there's, there's no level of distaste in his eye for you this morning because you're wearing the righteousness of Christ. Do you, you ever think about how like you can't, you can't top that to make him more pleased with you? Like God stepped out of heaven and gave everything for you. He lived a perfect life and he now puts that righteousness on you and you think that God loves you more because you've read your Bible every day this year. Or you get convinced that God doesn't love you because you haven't. That's the more like likely option, right? But when you understand that like God's redeemed you, he's offered you redemption, you see that, man, you know what? No, God loves me. And his desire was never for us to sort of cling to this moral policeman in the universe and try and do everything right and trying to do nothing wrong. But he goes, no, I wanna transform your heart because that's what you really need. You need a different heart. You need, you need to replace that heart of stone with something that's alive for the things of God. So the first thing that he offers us is our redemption the second thing that Jesus offers us at the communion table is our identity. He offers us a new identity. And so, <coughs> excuse me, um, Gary, I said I'd give you a finger and I did it in my bad. Hey, can we just give it up for Gary at the soundboard? Come on, like, and the booth, this, just the booth in general, these guys, the slides are on point every week, the sound works, and we just never clap for them. I think we should every now and then. Jesus offers us a new identity. There's so many things that we get our identity from in the world that we live in. There's so many different ways that culture and the world are kind of trying to delineate us to fit us into a certain caricature of a different person. And so we have, we have the identity, like even in this, you take just this room, for example, just this room. Man, we have people that live in gigantic houses. We have people that live in small houses. We have people who are just totally like white collar professional, you're very wealthy, come from a lot of money. We have people who come from nothing. We have people who don't even know how they're gonna cover rent in December. We don't, more or less like buy Christmas gifts on top of that, right? And so we have, we have people who vote red. We have people who vote blue. We have people who are doctors. We have people who are probably like garbage men. So one more, one more here. Okay, there we go. I did it right that time. Um, <laughs> So we have all these different ways. We have people who choose to homeschool. We have people who choose to go to public school or charter school or private school or whatever, right? We have, we have baby boomers. And then we have people who are getting online, the young people, and they're saying, okay, boomer, right? Like the six middle schoolers in the room right now just got that. And if you need to understand what I mean when I say, okay, boomer, just ask them, okay? Or I'll explain it to you later. We have all these different ways that we're, we're different. We have, we have uh, man, we have, we have people who didn't, grow up in affluent Loveland, Colorado. We have a lot of us that did. We have uh, uh, some of us in this room who know what it feels like to step into the room and be the minority, even though a lot of us don't. It's interesting. Um, Sunday morning is still one of the most segregated times in America today, right? I, I'm not trying to start a whole thing here. It's just fascinating to me because I know that that's not what heaven will be like. I, I'm not saying that we need to blow our church system up so that we have equal parts of every single different uh, race and ethnicity present at every single gathering. But what I am saying is that this verse in Revelation says that uh, um, all tribes, all peoples and languages will stand before the throne and before the lamb who will be clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and will all be crying out with one loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. So while segregation may be part of this world, still it will not be a part of heaven's economy. It just won't. 
and that's going to be awesome. And so those things all kind of make up who you are, but when we come to the communion table, all those things take a backseat to what heaven calls you. Heaven calls you a chosen son. Heaven calls you a chosen daughter, who God is pleased with. You're a saint in his eyes. And so when we come to the communion table, all of, all of those earthly forms of identity take a backseat to heaven's form of identity. That's who we primarily are when we come to the communion table, is we recognize and we realize that God has saved me, God has purchased me, he has bought me with a price, and he loves me deeply. And so I get to come and have a seat at dad's table as a son, as a daughter. And that's who we all are, together. We're all together come in that way to the communion table. All the other stuff, all the other ways that we're delineated, all the other ways that we're different fade for a moment. And we come as saints. We come as children to the communion table. So we get our redemption, we get identity, but then we also get, and this is my last point, we get a perfect place to pause. I just stop. See, like we're so wired in our culture that even like a three second pause is like tense, right? You're like, ah, I need to be doing something. Shouldn't he be talking? What's happening, right? Like you guys feel it, don't you? You feel it the same way I feel it. Like the tug on your heart, the tug on your mind to just be going in a thousand different directions all at once. Like I get notifications on my phone all day long. I've, I got phone calls, I got texts, I got emails. I got, I've got this thing going on, I got this thing going on. We're like, we're so moving, we're so busy. Everything's going a million miles an hour. Do you feel it? But so even to take a second, you leave your phone in your seat, you come up and you grab these elements. And again, it's just juice, it's just bread. But when we grab them, they become sacred. And we go, oh my gosh. I remember, I take, this t- I take this moment and I pause. I go, think about what Christ has done for me. Think about how he's purchased me. And we just, we just hit pause on our busy little lives, running around doing all these things that in the end just don't really matter. Can I just say it? Like if you don't respond to that text right away, like the company's not gonna explode. The, the office isn't gonna just collapse if you don't reply to that email today. So we take a moment at the communion table and we just hit pause. And we just think about who God is and what he's done. I I find an interesting juxtaposition in the the way that the Feast of Unleavened Bread like sort of commences our salvation. Uh, When you kind of look at it next to the picture of Jesus at at the table at the Last Supper, right? So like, let me, like we know that Passover is fulfilled Right? We, see that, we see that Jesus is our sacrificial Passover lamb in communion. We see that, right? We see that, okay, they, yep, they had to kill the lamb, and now we see that Jesus died in our place, and together those are the, the symbols of Passover. And Jesus is not just a symbol, but he is our Passover. He is the means at which our, God's judgment passes over us. But I think there's also something to this, this uh, unleavened bread, and certainly there's more to it because the leaven represents sin. But let me just like do this for a moment. I'm gonna stand... I'm gonna leave my Bible like kind of right over there, right? Do you see what I'm doing? Like over there is the inerrant, perfect word of God. Fallible, imperfect man, okay? So like we're distant right now. But does there not seem to be some sort of interesting imagery in the fact that Egypt's salvation was like, hurry, 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 do whatever you can. Like you gotta get out of there. You just gotta grab it and go. You gotta, don't even take the time. You gotta just leave right now. You gotta go. But the communion table at the Last Supper it specifically mentions that Jesus is reclining. Like he's not in a hurry. It, like it goes out of his way to say that he's like laying back at the table. You don't lay back at the table if you're like ready to get on to the next thing. But he's taking a minute and he's just sitting and he's just being. He's being with his people. He's understanding what God has called him to do, what he's about to go do. And I just think our, our approach to communion should be similar. Listen, it's not just some six-minute part of the second Sunday of every month. People are like, oh, that, okay, I get it. Oh, that's when we do communion. I thought it was just like once a month. But yeah, that does make sense now. It's the second Sunday of every month. Yes, it is. It's today. We're doing communion. And, and it's not just some like check the box thing. Like I, I just, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I just hope that you haven't come to the communion table going like, oh man, look at the time. We're probably gonna get out of here early today. Ah, uh, we might beat the brunch rush down to Doug's. Like we're gonna get down there. It's gonna be, I'll, I'll grab the kids, you grab the car and we'll just go, right? Like, man, but no, this is a moment, the sacred moment. It's a perfect place to just hit pause on your life. All the busy things, all the deals that are pulling you every which way and just spend a moment with your savior. 
recognizing and remembering that he broke his body for you and that he spilled his blood for you. And in that moment, he changed everything. So I want to be clear, um, because growing up, I, I attended a Catholic church from time to time. I'm not dogging on the Catholic church, okay? Um, it, this is not meant to be the sermon that proves why all other churches' forms or communion are wrong, that ultimately concludes with how our version of communion is right, right? Like, that's, that's not what I'm trying to do this morning. I'm just saying, I remember as a kid going to Catholic Mass on Christmas and Easter and, and not being allowed to participate in communion. And at the time, I, I mean, I'm like eight, you know, it's not really that big of a deal, but I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I would love a snack right now, you know? Like, why can't I do this? Like, everyone else gets to participate. Like, why don't I get to go up there, right? And, but, again, like, no, no disrespect or hate to the Catholic Church because we tell people every week, hey, if you don't believe this, then don't take it. Because, I, I, and I'll say that, if you don't believe in what Christ has done, then communion's not for you. Because it's a, it's a holy moment. Again, it's not just bread. It's not just, it is just bread. It is just juice. But when we take communion, when we come to the table, it is not those things. It is so much, it's deeply spiritual. And so if you, if you don't believe what we believe and you're here, well, let me just first off say, like, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm, I'm thrilled that you found a spot to wrestle with this tension of like, okay, what's going on? Do they have something there that I want to participate in? Or you just show up and you're here. And I appreciate that you're here. And I'll tell you, you are invited into every part of our church. You're invited, like, go, go to Israel with Robin this spring. Uh, we run down to Haiti a couple times a year. You can go see what God is doing in the world, okay? You can jump into a small group. You can take one of our pastors. I'll go out to coffee with you. And you can just lay all of your questions down on the table. I know you're wrestling with hard things. I know you're wrestling with real things. You can lay it all out on the table for me, and we can just talk about it. And you can still keep coming to church, and that's fine. That's okay. That's good. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, heck, my story I started coming to this church 12, 13, 14 years ago. I don't know. And I got invited to go to a missions trip. I wasn't a Christian. I was here because that girl was here. <laughs> I, wasn't I wasn't pursuing Jesus. I was pursuing her. Okay. And I'm just not dumb. She hung out here a lot. I was like, I'll go where she goes, you know. I went on a mission trip because I was welcome, because I felt like I belonged in this place, even though I didn't believe everything they believed. And that's still true today. I got invited to go on this mission trip. I gave my life to the Lord. I just, it, finally this moment happened and I wish I could describe it more clearly, but it was just clearly the Holy Spirit just began to work in my heart and enlighten to bring, like he brought things to light, my questions. He started to show me what this book means. He started to reveal himself to me. And more than you know, if you don't believe in what we believe, we long to see you one day come down to this table and participate in communion in all that it means. And if you, honestly, I'll say this, like if you want that to be, if you want this to be your first communion today, like come on, I'll be sitting right there during communion. There'll be prayer team people around the room. They got their lanyards on. You can already see some of them. Like pray with that person, talk with that person. You could take your very first communion today. Because again, it's not a religion. religion. It's not a system. You don't got to do a bunch of stuff to get in the club. You just got to proclaim faith in Jesus and then he saves you. So I'm gonna pray. And then we got like 15 minutes left. The band will close us in a song. And we're just gonna spend a moment in communion. We're not gonna be in a hurry. We're not gonna do this flippantly either. This is serious. Let's approach it with reverence today. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, you are so good. I love the thought that you earnestly desired to commune with your disciples in the same way that you earnestly desire with your children in this room today. You just can't wait to be with us. You can't wait until we put everything else on hold, so we put everything else on check and we just go, Dad, I'm here at your feet, remembering all that you've done for me. I'm gonna remember that you, that this came at a cost. I'm gonna remember that this was, this cost you everything, Jesus. And yet you did it eagerly so that I could be in a relationship with so that I could know your name, so that I could call on you in times of hurts, in times of struggle. God, we need you. So Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this place, fill our hearts. I pray that just in the same way you awakened my heart in Guatemala in like 2007, I think it was, would you awaken somebody's heart today when they just go, okay, I'm yours. Here I am. Would you meet them? Love you, Jesus.